and it's recording. Doctor, welcome. What's going on, Chad? How are you? Como se va? Ça va bien, ça va bien. Uh, I'm very glad you decided to uh, give, give me some time and uh, I have so much to learn from you. We all do and thank you so much for being here. Um, the man that I have here with me today needs no introduction. The only grappler to have competed in the Olympics, ADCC, IBJJF, Dr. Radi Ferguson, of course, doctor in physical education. Doctor, welcome. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, Chadi. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, today we have so much to talk about grappling wise, uh, training wise, because this is a, a topic that I've tackled many times on my channel, how to approach the weights room. Um, also the different approaches within, you know, arts like BJJ and Judo, which um, as Pedro Valente put it, um, different expressions of the same art. So that's a very, I'd say that's a very interesting uh, way to put it. So did, uh, what, did you what, have you ever talked to the Valente brothers? Yeah, I did. They are, in my opinion, the, the most honest and truthful practitioners of the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because they actually call it what it is. They understand that it's Judo. 100%. And they, and they admit 100% that they're doing Judo. 100%. Yeah. With, with, with a different focus and the their their approach is so freeing that they, they're not it's not ego laden at all they're like some really laid back guys um they're really really nice um i enjoy every time i'm running to them and meet them i enjoy talking to them they're just really really truthful about what they got what they learned and what they're teaching I mean, if the Pedro Valente, just he alone is like an open library, in my opinion. The, the man knows so much. And also the way he honors um, the, the original vision of Kodokan Judo and how Kano Sensei wanted it to be. If you just take a, a small look at Mind Over Muscle, you would see how Kano Shihan would have wanted it. If you have read his letter that he sent to Gunjiko Izumi regarding the Olympics and politics and nationalism and how it's going to shift and take away from Judo. You would see that this is what's happening today. A lot of what's happening today is not what he would have wanted, in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. so from, um, from an educational standpoint, that's not what he wanted. No, you know. And I, I was just on the phone today with somebody from USA Judo who asked me. They said, "Well, how can we grow judo?" I said, "You grow judo the same way you grow everything else." I said, "You grow it through education." And and I think the problem that I said I think the problem that you're having is that you have hurdles in the education process because you're still trying to get familiar with some of the new medium that's available. Available. The medium will always change. The internet and then the, there was post mail and FedEx and UPS. The medium of how we get information out will always change. I think the 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 under the underlying or under geared framework of or a theoretical framework of what we are supposed to give through the medium doesn't change. I think what Connell wanted us to give doesn't change at all. And I think you can do that through the medium of sport. You can do that through different organizations. You can do that through the internet. You can do that through video programs. You can do that through teaching. You can do it through, but most people who are doing those things, they have gotten so caught up in marketing and deliverability and how to how to make people buy things or get things that they they never learned the basic theoretical theoretical framework or conceptual framework from Kano. You know, we we know the the you know the we like to go with the the model of the Olympics and you know and all those particular things, but that that's not what judo is about. No man. J judo is about mutual worth, welfare, and benefit. That's, that means for everybody. Judo already has in, in it diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's already inside of judo. You know, judo for all was already inside of judo. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a mutual welfare. It's like everybody is supposed to get better who walks inside of the dojo. Everybody, everybody's not supposed to advance at the same rate. Everybody, everybody's put the welfare of the people. The yeah. welfare of the people. That means that means the health, the psychological health, the emotional health, 
the mental health, the physical health of the people, the welfare of the people are supposed to benefit. It's, and it's supposed to be mutual across the board. Right. And I, I think I think we've gotten to this thing where we think that the the practicing of judo is a zero sum game, which is I win, you lose. You know, um, you pay me and I teach. No, you pay me and I learn from you while you're learning from me. And you're providing the payment as a form of respect for the service that I offer, not because I'm better than you. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know if that's where we meant to go in the beginning of the podcast, but that's not a good place to start. Yeah, I mean, of course, like uh, that's one that's thing. thing. Yeah, I I see exactly what you're saying. For example, we see like two athletes, you know, shaking hands after a long fight. Like, oh, judo is about respect. Like, what do you want them to do? Like, beat each other up? Of course, they should respect <laughs> each other. But judo, like, if you read about it and what it's like to give and take, and you see the three levels of judo that Kano Shihan spoke about in um, Mind Over Muscle, uh, you would see that there's just so much missing elements today. Uh, just like the the fact that he wanted us to live drill with weapons, and then he he was talking. That's the first level, like to defend off attacks and constantly train and take stuff from kendo, like really practical stuff for self defense. And then later on, the second level is about you know how to smartly learn, learn from each other, learn by observing, um, put your ego on the side, or keep your mind always open, which is something that a lot of us really need to do. And then the final level, which is the third, which is, you know, creating a better society. That's, uh, you know, mutual welfare for self and others. So Mm -hmm. uh, you would see that, you know, it's not about just, oh, I just bowed down to the mat and I shook my opponent's hand after, you know, the fight is over. That's just like, like you can do that in basketball. So um, that's not like what judo is about. Like we uh, we pride ourselves, you know, we don't talk trash or smack like you see in press conferences of MMA or you know, a pro wrestling or whatever, but a judo is just that that's barely scratching the surface when it comes to being a better person and com- contributing to society, in my opinion. And I tell people, and some of the randori's, some of the randori sessions are scraps, though. So, and some of the, some of the, and some people don't like to use the word fight, um, but it just, yeah. it's just a language difference. Some, you know, it's a language difference. Yeah. Uh, some of the fights, man, in judo are, then knock down drag out fights, you know what I mean? But at the end of it, at the end of it, we don't talk trash before. I never had a I never had a judo opponent where we talked trash before we fought. Ever. Like ever. Like ever. Um but on the mat, like those five minutes that we were fighting, oh my gosh. You you would <laughs> you would have sworn we had some big differences. And and we did have a difference, you know. The difference was, and I tell people, they say, "What is a judo match like?" I said, "Well, I said it's it's a physical negotiation." I said, "I come to the table with my proposed contract, and my c- contract is, I propose that I win, and that and that you lose by these particular methods." <laughs> and then you say, "No, well, I I disagree with you. I propose that I should win." And you should lose by these particular methods. And then you say, well, I accept what you said. And the other person says, well, I accept what you said, too. And then let's bow and let's figure it out. And then you bow and then you go through a contract negotiation. And the beautiful thing about a contract negotiation, a really good contract negotiation, nobody gets everything that they want, that they want. You don't get everything that you want in a contract negotiation. But then you're able to negotiate the contract and finish and then walk off the mat. And that's what makes judo so different because we have matches where the negotiation didn't go our way. It was an extra shito that we didn't think we should have gotten, or it was something, or sometimes it's a bad call by a ref, or sometimes um, we got called for a head dive. But when 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 the negotiation doesn't go your way, you just walk away from the negotiation table and you leave. And that's it. And, and, and you don't you don't jump up in the stands and tear up the seats and and people say, well, how, how, how do you how do you guys keep going back when the when there's no like you guys can't protest the 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 calls or anything like that? I said that's part of judo. I said part of judo is understanding the serenity prayer. 
is 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 understanding the things that accepting the things that you can't change and having the wisdom to know the difference. I said some things you just can't change. This, the call was bad. They're not going back. They're not going to review it. They're not going to change it. And that's just the end. I mean, to this day, I still believe in my heart of hearts, um, the best judo player to ever play, in my opinion, is David Duye, in my opinion. And people ask me about David Duye in comparison to Teddy Renner. I said, there's no comparison. I said, what do you mean? Teddy Renner? I said, there's no comparison. I said, David Duye played in a time well, you could grab the legs and do Tegaruma and double leg. And, and if Teddy Renner played during that time, trust me, his, his record would be very different because he's 6'8". Mm. Oh, but, yeah. And I, I know I sat there and watched that match in 2000 between David Duye and Shinohara. And that was, that was the perfect match where the referee should have made a no call. Mm. And let them continue to fight until it was really, really clear. Yeah. And you're talking about the Sydney finals. Yes, the Sydney finals. Uh, it's, a very, it's still debated to this day. Like it's still, exactly. And the thing about it, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. If you, if if, if they would have let it play out, because you you have Shinohara, I, I I saw I saw I saw it the way Shinohara saw it. I also saw it the way David Duye saw it. That Sukashi was just like, it's right in your face. Like to me, that, there's no debate to me. There's no debate because you're from France. Just like I was, I was sitting, I was sitting next to Yamashita. Ah, so, okay. In the stands. To Yamashita, there was no, there was no debate either. But did anybody riot? Did anybody protest? Small protest, but not. But did, did anybody throw? You, you argue. Back? You, 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 yeah. Did, did any referees get killed in the parking lot? Did they go to a referee's house and burn it down? And I'm not talking bad about soccer, but man, listen, you make a, you make, you make a bad call in soccer, man, or a controversial call in soccer. You need, you need witness protection. <laughs> yeah, like I've been to football stadiums. Yeah, it's not, a yeah. free, oh it's not God, a pretty it's thing. Like even going to the restroom, you, you might, like, something might happen to you. <laughs> And it's just, um, it's just different. Our sport, our sport is just a more refined sport, yeah. and that that's what cha- that's what differentiates it from jujitsu. And I really love the people like Salo and Janji Ribeiro, who still keep the the principles of judo inside of their dojo, you know. Right. The white geese, the bowing, the, li- the lining up, the respect. They run a they their jujitsu program is like a judo program. Mm-hmm. It's I mean it's really really nice, and I, I I have a great amount of respect for people who still run it like that. Right. Speaking of jujitsu, uh, you being a red and white belt in judo, sixth dan I believe. Yes. And fourth dan jujitsu. Yes. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> Pretty high, yes. <laughs> yeah, like again, the only person to have competed in IBJJF Worlds, ADCC, and the Olympics. We'll get to the Olympics in a little bit. But uh, in terms of the approach, uh, someone once asked me, and we, we had a very long talk, and I always said this if you want to learn judo for jujitsu, that again, that's me. It's not uh, time wise, it's not the best investment because a throw as simple as old Chigari can take years to become years. to become just at least good at it. Good to become good. Like yes. most of us, I, I'm not talking about Tokoiwaza. I'm just talking, I'm not about, talking about a to good, be good throw. Right. So I'm 46 right. now. I'll be 47 in April. I, I need to make a small point, please. Just go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. so I said that learning judo for BJJ to go through all these thousands of repetitions, thousands of uchikomis, nagekomi, etc. For two points. Or, and if you land in his guard, sometimes you don't get those two points. To me, it's not, it's, it's not a good investment. However, vice versa, if you learn jiu-jitsu and you're a competitive judoka, then yes, that's going to help you. Because, you know, Neiwaza is quick. And you have to act really quickly in judo. You stand up and on the ground. So having superior Neiwaza when things, you know, happen to go down to the ground, it's going to benefit you a lot. But vice versa, you know, having the takedown element from judo in BJJ, to me, it's not 
worth the investment for, for competitive reason. I'm not talking about self-defense, but for competitive reason, it's not like ideal. So it kind of makes a lot of sense when they go for you know ankle pick, uh, single leg. Uh, they they like bother each other with like a double leg. It's not the best like like yours or like from the like uh, Kate Howie from Britain in judo. Yes. It's not the best, but nonetheless they they get a lot of good results. And against the untrained thug, you're gonna just absolutely smash them. So. I want your opinion uh, on the approach, takedown wise, from both. Like, why is there such a difference? Is it just you know the the amount of hours it takes to get good at a judo throw, or um, you know is it good like this? What should be done? Uh, what do you think? Like, if it's judo versus BJJ, you know, takedown addition, how do you put it in your words? Let me say this though: my favorite woman judo player is Kate Howie. Yeah. She's, she's, after, she's after that, after that is Rhonda, but it's my favorite when I was competing. Kate Howie loved her, absolutely fantastic. Um, I remember um, nobody talks about her. I don't know why. Man, world champ, man. Like, world champ. The best pickups, like whoa. Listen, the best. I remember when I I met her at a training camp in Spain in 2000. I was just in awe of her. I was like, oh my god, that's Kate Howie. You know what I mean? And she, I mean, just ripped up, just like a brick house, man. Um, and just really, really pleasant. But to ask your question, let me say this. Everything is based upon the incentives, you know? When I was competing in jujitsu in the, in the early 90s, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, if you threw the guy, boom, and they hopped up, it was two points. So a Tao Toshi, boom, when you fall down and you get up, two points. Now they change the rules when you throw the person, you have to hold them down to control them which I don't understand because I think that if you slightly pee on yourself, you lost control of yourself and I can see it on your pants. You know what I mean? Nobody walks out there and, and falls down on purpose. You know what I'm saying? So if the person threw you, it they should be two you. points no matter if you get up or not. You understand what I'm saying? But the rules have changed. So a lot of people now, you know, they pull guard and they do these other things that are just anti, anti art of war, okay? All martial arts should be based on the art of war. All martial arts games should be based on the art of war. That's another discussion. But in my opinion, I think that people should learn judo for judo, learn jujitsu for jujitsu, and then decide which points or parts of elements of the game work best for them. Because I will tell you this, the takedown part of judo is not as important as the grip fighting. Now, I've met plenty of people who have way better, way better tachiwaza than, than I do. The kumikata is not better. And if you have a treasure chest of throws, you have to access those by with the key to open them. And if, you're, if your kumikata is no good, your throws are no good. Now, the one beautiful thing that I like about France is that at the ch at the kids' level, they don't allow any grip fighting at some of the tournaments. They make the kids go out and just grab and then play because they don't want to stop the advancement of the art of judo because everybody's not going to be a competitor, but everybody at one point, everybody is going to be in position to teach the art form. Everybody's not going to be in a position to be a world champ or national champ. So I, un I understand that approach. From a competitive standpoint, man, learning how to grip fight is everything. It's everything. I spent most of my time, I spent most of my time grip fighting. My, a good friend of mine, Lloyd Irvin, he teaches his students and he has world champions and he's, they're homegrown that he's trained from when they started all the way to the end. He teaches them how to grip fight. They don't have they don't have great judo. Their judo is good enough, but their grip fighting is superb. If you go to the other problem is that, and you know this too, um, Chatty, is that there's not a lot of people who can teach you how to grip fight. No. No. In the United States, I don't care who, I don't care who, I don't care who who says what. The bottom line in the United States, there are less than 10 people in the United States who can teach you a grip fighting system 
from start to finish understanding lefty and righty, not tactics, not strategy. I'm talking about a full system with rules, theorems, and corollaries. That's it. But if you learn how to grip fight, you can become an amazing jujitsu player. Amazing because you I, you now determine if I'm if I'm playing top or if I'm playing bottom. You you That's make the determination. Uh, yeah. That's another thing uh, when it comes to um, judo jujitsu is the grip fighting. We sometimes we use very similar terms, but they mean a completely different thing. For example, lapel feed. The stand up is not a lapel feed on the uh, at the bottom. Uh, what else? Uh, collar sleeve. The best collar sleeve grip in stand up is parallel, while on the ground at the best is crossed. Cross, correct. So correct. even with those terminologies that we have in common, there's a lot of differences in the approach. So um, take down again. We go back to take down wise because again, when you're Priority is the tap. You're not gonna. You're not gonna bother yourself with, like stand up kumikata. You're not gonna bother yourself with thousands of reps of uchikomi and nagikomi. But let me take something. You yeah. should. Well, how? You should because when you get to the high level of guard play, it's about grip fighting. But it's, I'm talking about the, the that's ground grip fighting, or you're talking about the stand up. It. Becoming good at stand-up grip fighting is going to make you good at ground grip fighting once you learn what to do in terms of ground grip fighting. Mm. The hand speed of a judo player is way faster than the hand speed of it. First of all, a judo player, a world champion judo player, is they're on a you can take the <laughs> you can take the jujitsu world champ. In the weight uh, on the weight class that he, whatever he or she is in, and take the judo world champ or whatever weight class, they are not the same. One is a is a world class elite athlete. The other one is really really good at what they do. Not the same. I've seen the numbers. I've done the VO two max tests. Yeah. I've done Who's the strength. The athlete. The, the they're not the same athlete, man. Yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not even. The, they're not even. The, it's not even fair to. Me it's not even fair to measure them in the same category. You can take both of them yeah. and run a time mile. You could take both of them and do power cleans and snatches. You could take both of them and do the shuttle test. You could, they're not they're not the same. It's not. It's like it's like a um, NFL person playing with a high schooler. It's just it's not the same. That's one thing I I like if I if I want to if I would to separate a jujitsu world champion and a judo world champion or whatever. Like the differences to me is jujitsu. They, they, I don't know. I don't know if it, like I, I don't mean it in a bad way, but of course it's the rules. But it's they the way they conduct and they you know plan out everything as if they have all the time in the world. While like a judoka is like he left the oven on almost. <laughs> so I, exactly. Like because you, it, I, you have to like you have to be quick. No stalling rules. In jujitsu, you can stall. Yeah, like yes. for example, yeah, like how many like in judo, for example, you get the back take, you get the figure four, then you start to craft the rear naked choke. It's a few seconds until you're stood back up. In jujitsu, when you cut it, first of all, you got your four points, and then you can just craft away until you get that rear naked choke or the uh, like sliding collar strength. And, and let me tell you something. And judo should not be like that. When it's done right, it shouldn't be like that. But the problem is, is we have different regions, different biases different referees and judo as long as you are technically progressing Advancing. yeah yes the nation but the problem is is that every referee okay so the referees that are refereeing now yeah. are the ones that are, are either my age or a little bit older than me hmm. many of them did not have great newaza so if you don't have good newaza you can't even see you can't even see a you can't even see an omoplata being set up. Hmm. You can't. You 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 don't. You can't see it. Right. I can be on the bottom in the guard, left hand cross cross sleeve to the to, to my opponent's left sleeve, my right hand on the, my opponent's um, outside of their their left knee. I swing my left knee over like I'm going to the turtle, 
to, to fake and then whip back through to the Oma Plata. And by the time I whip back through to the Oma Plata, they've called what? Mate. Mate. Yeah. But they can't see it. Yeah. And the problem is, and I've offered this to the referees in the United States, why not bring in a high-ranking judoka who also does Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Yeah, you can, you can use me, Travis Stevens. You can use anybody or use, or use a lot of us to show you some of the newer Nawaza techniques that are going on right now mm. from Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Show you some of the setups so that, so that you can see some of the stuff that you can't see. Yeah. I, I know for me in this day and age, it's very difficult for me to think about having my son and my daughter invest in a sport in an art where the level of incompetence at the ref in terms of refereeing is is super high. Like at the IGF, at the, we you have IGFA referees, which are great, good. But before you get there, case in point, we have people in the United States who travel internationally and they fight, and they fight based upon the international rules, you know, attacking and moving, and then they come home, and then they fight on a national circuit or a local tournament. And the referee doesn't know the rules. And they're penalizing the person who's one of the top ranked people in the world and calling Mate and stopping him, and they don't know any better. Yeah. That, that level of frustration is super, super, super high. It's high. And it's hard to make that particular investment in the sport. It's, it's just hard to make that investment in the sport as a, as a, as a coach and a parent and an athlete. Very difficult. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I still remember my first tournament. Um, I was up against this black belt and I was constantly on the, on the offense. Even though it was black belt, I was orange belt. Uh, I went for Tomoe Nage a few times. He would drop. So it wasn't a false attack. But, you know, I would drag the arm, try to go for like a jujigatame, like your, your basic, you know, arm bar from guard. At the moment, I'm like starting to drag the arm and he's like there. So I, all I have to do is just like get my leg up. The referee is like, and it was a very old referee. It's like, Mate, like, why? Right. And it can be, it can be frustrating. Yeah. It can be frustrating. I remember watching videos of Flavio Canto. He's almost ready to submit the person, and they call yeah. my. But he yeah, never. Yeah, yeah. But Flavio never got frustrated. Yeah. Never ever got. That's so the one thing I. I used to watch Flavio for that reason to watch him. He never got frustrated. Mm. Maybe he was frustrated mentally, but he never let it show. And when I was when I was competing, I, I was watching some of my matches. Sometimes that's a that's a bit of a weakness because. You got to stay in the match. You complaining is not going to change the ref's call. Yeah. You know, it's like you're making that face because you want people to know if I lose, I lost because of this. Mm. And and I've done that before. I've done that before, man. I've I I have displayed and exhibited some of that weakness and it's something that and it is a weakness. And it's a lack of maturity as a as a competitor that you have to get over um and it just takes time. Just takes time, and I was not in that space and place when I was when I was younger. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, to me now, like knowing a lot about judo and how things you know go, uh, and how things change, and when they talk about spectator friendly, and when they talk about popularity and numbers, the more I learn about this. I mean, I I've had a long. Uh, it was a very good talk and discussion and debate with uh, Neil Adams himself. And I was, uh, it's, it's always like a pleasure to look back on it, but it was about the whole leg wraps thing. Now, the more I look on it, the more I reflect on it, the more I'm adamant that it should be back the way it is. First of all, the, the, the discussion started like this. 
the, the IOC came to us and said, your athletes are starting to look like this. And, uh, you know, popularity numbers, wrestling, etc. So you need to figure out what to do. First of all, why is the IOC shaping judo? That's my first question. And two, shouldn't the Kodokan have a say? For example, I had a talk with um, Otaro Sasaki. His brother is Takeshi Sasaki, who won the Paris Grand Slam the, the, the past November in the 81. He says that in Kodokan, like the Kohaku Shiai, the monthly contest, etc., they're still doing their own thing. You, you can still see Morotegari. You can still see uh, Teguruma, etc. They, they, they still have their Yuko. Uh, so... I don't know why isn't Kodokan shaping judo instead of IOC and you know the Olympics because I mean I, I, I'm going to tell you this yeah right? I've been in those meetings because I was a head coach with Bahamas Judo Federation yeah and you we never saw any written articulation from the IOC on that that is a narrative that the IJF is giving us oh that the people were bent over too much and that. I watched the old world championships. Like they looked really well. Like if you see Inoue Kose yourself, I mean, like that's the thing that that that's was that was, that's what I was getting at. It's that we pride ourselves of being the kings of throws, artists. You see this masterpiece being put in front of you when we throw. So shouldn't we at least be able to attack and defend the entire body? So for example, the two thousand the two thousand and four match between you and Jang, that was like absolutely epic. Anyone who is watching this, you should go and see it. Jang, Riley Ferguson, the, the fight, at least the highlights will pop up. I mean, you rained hellfire on this man with so many attacks, so many shots. You're one of the best lower body takedown artists or throwing artists in the history of judo, I would say, or at least in the recent history. And yet he defended every one of them. And he even got to turn one on you and he scored a Yuko, I believe. Yes. That's a judoka. And Jang himself had a good Teguruma. Like, it's not he only did. like Uchimata Sukashi and Uchideshi, like, or, you know, strangle someone from Seonaga. It should be like this complete system of offense and defense. And we should be able to fend off and do every single takedown. We pride ourselves on being the kings of it. It's like, let's not shy away from a problem or whatever narrative. Like, let's that, do the whole thing. Let's do the whole And that's why nobody. I'm, you're not going to find, in my opinion, a better Tachiwaza technician for Uchimata than Kosei Inoue. No way. Because Kosei Inoue played judo in a time where you could do Tegaruma. Yeah. These guys are playing judo in a time where you can do a bad Uchimata and, and get away with it. Oh, my gosh. I've, I've done Randori with Kosei Inoue before. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I've thrown him with I've thrown him with Take a Ruma. I've thrown him with Murray Tegar. Oh yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> no, was, but yeah. That did I took way more falls than he did. Yeah. We were in Spain and it was two thousand. And we trained together in two thousand. I trained with him. And then right after I went did Randor with him, the Japanese sent Suzuki over and I did I did right over with Suzuki, and then after that, they sent Shinohara over, and I was like, <laughs> it was round after round after round. Now, I, I was doing Randor with them anyway, and then they sent Suzuki out, and uh, somebody said to um, my coach, Eddie Liddy, he's like, oh, man, Roddy's in trouble. And Eddie was like, no, he's not. Eddie's like, watch this. Man, I picked Suzuki up, boom, ran him into the gate, boom. Threw. Now, Suzuki still threw me at least six, seven times in that round. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it was a good round. After the rant, after the Randori session was over, I bumped into Kosei Inoue in the hallway. Yeah. He gets down, puts his bag down, opens up his bag, folds up his gi, hands it to me, and says, you, United States Ichiban. The best I have, in the US. I have, I have his gi. His, I have his gi. It's in my garage now because I got it out of storage. Uh, I have, his gi is in a frame. He wow. gave, me, he's gave me his gi. Folded wow. it up. Gave it to me, oh. and we and we trained we trained together at um at Tokyo University. Wow, oh. you know something? Um, when it comes to leg grabs, uh, he also defended quite a few. Like if you see the finals in the World Championship '99, I believe against Jang, 
Yes. Jang went for like a million teguruma. He would like somersault and flip and just to avoid the takedown. Um, in the against Mikalain in 2007, he was hit with a double leg Morotegari. Uh, he 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 got away with like a yuko, but still he beat him with superior group fighting. He couldn't attack him. Man, this dude, this dude. Um... His DVD is my bible, by the way. Yeah, I love it. So Tamenov, okay? Yeah. Oh, Tamenov was a oh beast. Gosh. Oh my gosh. So I've done randoi with. I've done Rando with Inoue. I've done Rando with Suzuki. I've done groundwork with, with um, uh, what's my man's name? From uh, Van der Geest. <laughs> Which one, Elko or? Um... The bigger one, the biggest one. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I was, <laughs> the big one I'm doing, same, same camp in Spain, the big one I'm doing groundwork with, and I caught him in a choke. Yeah. Wow! And then he gets out of the choke. He was pissed, but my groundwork was good at that time. So after we finished groundwork, I'm gonna tell you about Tamenov. After we finished groundwork, I'm walking by. He grabs me, says, "Me, you." I said, "No, man." He says, "Yes, me, man." I just laid out. I just laid out on the floor. <laughs> I just laid out. If there's one, if there's one thing that I wanted no part of, I was not the type of hundred kilo player that can fight heavyweights. You have your, you have hundred kilo. You got Inoue, Suzuki, Elko, those type of guys. They have a style. They can fight heavyweights. I did not have the type of style where I could where I could fight heavyweights because I, if I got tired, I was going to get hurt. Mm. I didn't have that type of play. Going back to Tamanov, I've done Randor with Inoue. I can move him. I've done Randor with Suzuki. I can move him. Muneta. Can't move, but it's a different type of can't move. He's just a he's tank. Small and stocky. He's small and stocky. Tamanov, he feels like walking pliable concrete. When I saw Suzuki throw him, I think it was in 2008, I thought that was the most remarkable thing ever. I thought Suzuki was going to, I thought he was going to get punished. Mm. Tamanov is so strong, it is un. Real. Like, that's how strong he is. I've been in the weight room with Kose in a way. I've watched Kose lift. He's watched me lift. Kose in a way is a strong dude. Not anywhere in the same category as Tamanov, and not as strong as me on any lifts, but strong dude. Speaking of lifts, that's, that's, I mean, you, you know this more than any of uh, any of us. So, um, this is something I've tried to tackle many times on my channel because, you know, as grapplers, we're not bodybuilders. Um, we we want to stay with, especially joint wise. We want to keep them as fresh as possible, mobile as possible. Like you see these Ro Ronnie Coleman, uh, Dave Palumbo, all these guys. Like they lift biblical weights for years and years and years. They have like the best shoulders, but then after they retire, boom, shoulder replacement surgery. So. I've tackled the how to lift or I've compared like the old Taiso of the Japanese, you know, before the protein powders, before the weights room, like they would carry each other, they would run. Like you still see the Japanese do exercises with each other that will clearly build you up. Um, that's not that's not that's not how they lift, though. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but I'm talking I'm talking about like, for example, a recreational judoka who competes, you know, locally just to have fun. If he's doing those Japanese exercises, which a lot of he's schools fine. do, like he's you're going to be really fine with good randori. You're going to have good cardio. You're going to be like really strong and really fit. But if you want to go at the highest level, you need to go to the waste room. There's just no way about it. So as a doctor in physical education, um, what's the best way for a grappler to approach the waste room? Like sets, reps, philosophy, concept. Like what should he look for in the waste room? Like I've tackled this, and the comment section is always like a complete mess. Like, oh, you need to be a power lifter. Oh, you need to do calisthenics for your no, joints. Oh, you need. It, to... it, 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 What's it, the best it, way to enter the gym? The best way to enter in, in, the gym is based upon your goal set. I want to be the best judoka. Let's just say that. Okay, so you want to be the best judoka where? In the what? In the world. You want to be the best. Or judoka? I want to win nationals, like France, U.S. Like it's a big, big, big. 
it's a yeah, big you, platform. France, French nationals. You want to win French nationals. You want to win French nationals. Basically, you're saying you want to win Paris. <laughs> right. You want to win the Paris Open. The French. Right. That's what it is. That, I mean, because if you're the best in Paris, it's possible you got a good chance of winning the French, the Paris Open. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. It's tough in Paris. You have a lot of world champs, top seven in the world. So basically, you're saying you want to be one of the best judo players in the world. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay, if you want to be one of I the mean, best... I mean, hypothetically, obviously. If you want to be best, one of the best judo players in the world, if this is how it goes, all right? We ask ourselves... First, you need to understand what's called the chronological landscape. How much time do I have? So, if... How old are you right now? I don't know. I, I, I started judo at 27. I'm 31 now. So, just don't... Never mind. No, no, but... I just do it... Like let's just say I'm I'm 17 and okay, I'm just got, I just got my black belt. At 17, you want to be so we'll look at 17. We'll say okay, 17, you want to be one of the best in the world. So at 17, we got to ask ourselves, what year is it? So 17 is 2022. So are we getting ready for the world championships or are we getting ready for the Olympics? You'll say I I, I want to win the Olympics. I say great. So here's what we do. We have, in 2022, is it enough time for us to make the Olympics in 2024? The answer is what? No. In 2028, is it enough time for you to make the Olympics? Possibly. So now we start running the timeline. We have six years. So in those six years, now this is, this is how you really do it, ladies and gentlemen. In those six years that I ask you, from 17 to 23, what are you going to be doing? You say, I'm going to what? Train. University. Oh. Right? You tell me you're going to university. I said, well, well you, you can't go to university and, 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 and be one of the best in the world for where you're at right now, unless you're going to go to school online. You want to go to school online? You say, yeah, I want to go to school online. I said, great. Go to school online and we map it out. I said, well, I'm going to need you a block of time in the morning and a block of time in the evening. In the morning, I'm going to need a block of like five to eight. In the evening, I'm going to need a block of five to eight. And somebody's going to say, well, you, you don't need three hours. Yeah, you do need three hours. You need time to wake up, to brush your teeth, to, to urinate, to defecate, to get dressed, to get to the gym, yeah. to finish the gym, to come home, to take the protein shaker, eat, to settle down, to shower, and then get ready for class. And then you have a nap in the middle of the day. And then you have to come in the evening. And you have to go to practice. You got to drive to practice, get to practice, leave practice, go home. Five to eight, five to eight. I see. Then after that, I got. I ask you. Uh, um, so you have a girlfriend? Modern day. You have a boyfriend. Whatever you have. Do you have? You have somebody you're dating? And the person says, Yeah, I got somebody I'm dating. And then you say, Well, you're gonna have to either remove them from the program, or you're gonna have to give up some of your training time. Because those are the facts. Because if you're hanging out with somebody, you're not resting, you're not sleeping, you're not lifting, you're not watching video, right? So how much of your training time do you want to give up? And what you'll say is, I'm willing to give up one day a week. So that means your Saturday or your Sunday, you want to hang out with your significant other. This is, this is how the training block is actually made up. So when the people, and what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people, we're going to get sets of reps and all, we're going to get all that first. first this is all the stuff we put in first. Boom. Then I say, um, OK, so Monday through Friday. All right. We're five to eight, five to eight, all the way through. You have class. You have a nap in the middle of the day from 12 to one. And you're spending time with your your significant other on, on what? Saturday or Sunday? What day you want to pick? Saturday. Saturday. So good. On Saturday, you're spending time. When are you going to spend time on Saturday? Afternoon, evening. Afternoon, evening. So what? Five to eight? Five to eleven. Five to eleven? Yeah. Okay, five five to eleven, because he's seventeen. So five to eleven. So good. That, 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 that's your time, five to eleven. So let me ask you a question. Do you go to church? Uh Mosque. Do you go anywhere? Do you I, on Sunday morning? Well, it depends. Like I don't know. Maybe they're we got a training yeah. schedule, so it's no depend. Either you either 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 uh, we have we have spiritual we have spiritual edification in the program, or we don't. Mm. What do you believe, sir? Because you didn't you didn't waffle when it came to the training times, right? 
So are you at the mosque? Are you at the synagogue? Are you at church on Sunday? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. What time? Uh, eight till 10. Good. So now the training block is already set up. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday block, Sunday block. Evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday block is set up. Then we need a rest day. So what day we're going to rest? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday. What day? What day we're going to block out no lifting, no training? What day? I'd say Sunday. Sunday? Yeah. You're, I mean, you had your dates, you had your training, and then, you know, you, you come back fresh on Monday. Yes. You already got Sunday off. Why? Because Sunday's a rest day. Automatic. Oh, okay. Do so I have to pick day? another one? Yes. Uh, Friday. But no, Friday. Friday is like the heaviest. Like you, we do leg like day, like randories are tough. I'm gonna Wednesday. Say, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday in the middle Correct. of the week. You need so it. now we know. We know Monday, Tuesday, killer. Rest. Tuesday, Thursday, killer. Saturday, technical morning, right? Time with girlfriend. Sunday, spiritual. Rest. Monday, boom. So now, now we know what the workout looks like. So now. We are now six years out. So six years out, we need to do an assessment. What are we looking to develop six years out? Do we do circuit training six years out? No. Six years out, we develop strength, what we call hypertrophy, or what they call GPP. Hypertrophy and GPP are damn near the same. General, um, general physical preparation. Hypertrophy, same thing. It's just a lot of reps. This is where we focus on the major lifts, like the bench, the, the deadlift, and the squat. And then the supplemental stuff around it, hamstring curls, leg extensions, biceps, triceps, shoulder press. Nothing crazy, no uchikomi bands. We're just getting strong as shit for one, two years strong. Mm. Set some reps. Now, the next two years, we start working power. Because now we have the soft tissue, has our, the soft tissue, the, the, the tendons and the ligaments and everything, they've, they've all... What do you mean by power? I'm going to tell you. The, the soft tissue has all has become acclimated to the training. Mm -hmm. Now, after we work the strength, now we start working the power. Power equals force times velocity. Now we're starting to move weight fast. So now we're starting to clean, snatch, snatch pulls, squat jumps split squat jumps, um, dumbbell cleans. Now we're working power, explosive power, um, explosive uh, push-ups, um, rotational power, a lot of med balls. We're working a lot of power. So everything now, we're going from strength to power. We're getting powerful. Everything explosive. is explosive, threes and fives. and Velocity. Exactly. And we're sprinting. And then those the next the two years after that, we're working what's called power conversion, which we call metabolic training. Now, this is where we start doing the circuits. This is where we start circuit training. We start circuit training. At first, you start time and attention. 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 12 exercises. Then you go 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, same 12 exercises. Then 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off. And then after a while, it's just 30 seconds and keep moving to the exercise. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And then you move from that to reps. Pick your exercises and you do the reps. You do the reps. And then you keep trying to reduce your time so you get more work done in a smaller period of time. That lets you know you're getting more, you're getting powerful. And then I start adding more reps to try to, to try to get myself to put as much work as possible within a four-minute time frame and work my circuits. That's my power conversion. That is what we call metabolic training. That's when you got the band and the Uchi Kong with the or quick snack, bop, 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 hurdle jumps, Uchi Komis, rotation, throws, jumping over the hurdles about over and over and over again. Because now I want I want to I want to start assimilating the training to the, met, the the type of metabolic load that I'm handling inside the environment of playing in judo. So all those things are correct. Sets and reps are correct. Heavyweight. And 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 uh, small reps, so working on power, all, that's correct. 
the metabolic training is correct, but the timing at which you do it is the most important. And now your judo training, this is the problem, has to correlate with the strength and conditioning. Hmm. Meaning those first two years when I'm in the dojo, lots of throws, lots of nagakomi, lots of, not a lot of randori, lots of, just lots of throws, lots of combos, lots of, lots, and a whole lot of newaza. Because my body's sore because the volume is so high in the weight room. And I need, I need to push, I need to push the newaza, push the newaza, push the newaza, push the newaza. Why do I need to push the newaza early? Because I don't have time to, to focus on newaza as I get closer to the Olympics or closer to the Worlds. When I get close to the world, I need to be focusing on tactics and strategies and, and, and throws. Grip fighting. And grip fighting. Putting people down. One question. Yes. So the first cycle, which is, you know, getting really strong. Uh, are we talking 6 to 12 reps? This is what people don't realize. People don't. <laughs> that stuff that you read in the magazines ain't the real deal, man. Some of these, some of these sets... You ever, a, you ever done a century set? Like I'm talking like Mike Menzer type sets, like where you go to the last rep, you're like, that's right, it. exactly. I'm talking about sets of a hundred. Have you, done, you ever done a hundred? No. Yes. So we, I was doing this with my son. You're on the leg press using just one leg at a time. First set, just 45 on each side. First set, 100 reps, one leg. Boom, boom, boom. Then after, then you're warm now. Then Three plates on each side. Boom. Go. One leg. Till you, can't, till you can't go anymore. And then drop set. Boom. Drop set. Boom. Drop set to nothing. Boom. And then the other leg. Boom. Boom. Now we're on the hamstring curl. Leg is it is It is an insane amount of work because we're just trying to get the body ready to do more work. Mm. You, 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 what you're doing, you're creating the base of the building. The wider the base, the higher I can go. If the base is narrow, I can't go high. So I got to get a wide base that I can go high. Okay. That's the most interesting approach I've ever seen. Like, I never expected. I thought you were going to say, you know, like, for example, I've talked with, you know, high level Japanese judokas. They say, the legs are the foundation. Um, get really strong on squats, on any type of cleans, and heavy rows. You see them doing heavy rows and pull-ups. And, of course, some upper body press, like shoulder and or bench press. But it's mainly the squat and the cleans that they really focus on. And they get really strong 5 to 10 reps. That's their rep range usually. Uh, but like the way you put it out in so many, in such detail and, and, and such a and different approach, yeah, I've would never see. expected this type of answer. But that's what you would see. You would see that rep range on the first year of the two years in the middle. Mm. Remember, this is the big macro cycle I'm giving you. A lot of people, when they get a program, okay, so. A lot of people when they get a program. All right, I don't know if people can see this. All right, yeah. so that's a that's a strength conditioning program. Remember the one the one page that you see of somebody's program is one page out of a notebook like this. So you don't know, you you have no idea what you're looking at. The person could be hurt. They could be coming off an injury. They could be coming off of a, a tournament. It could be the beginning of a cycle, be the change of the cycle. It could be three weeks in. It could be five weeks in. You, you don't know what the hell you're looking at. Like my son's strength and conditioning coach, I, he just thought his notebook is like this. You can, you can look at one day and be like, why is he, why is he doing that? You know, it might be an offloading day or what we call the deloading day. Yeah. Like, okay, so this is um, this is this program is wave loading. He has Squats, okay? He has six sets of squats. 20, 15, 10, 15, 10, 5. And then he has six sets of lunges. 20, 15, 10, 15, 10, 5. And then six sets of deadlift. 20, 15, 10, 15, 10, 5. Then he has another exercise on the stability ball for hamstrings. It's called a triple threat. That, that's just one day. That's a lot of legs. 
And when I when I do it, I do 20, 15, 10, 15, 10, 5, 10, 5, 3. And that would be just deadlift. Then I go through the same thing on squats. Then I go through the same thing on lunges. That's during that strength phase. See. I mean, yeah, like for example, the people see like a Jay Cutler routine or a Ronnie Coleman routine, and they just want to take it and do it the same. Like, you don't know when Ronnie did this or <laughs> how many calories he was eating when he was doing this or what 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 kind of stuff he was spinning when he was doing this. So right, and and you know, and that's the thing you can't look at like you can't go grab somebody's paper from, you know, and I'm not talking bad. I'm just you can't grab somebody's paper from. Let me say it like this: you can't grab somebody's paper from. The Soviet Union in 1972. I, let me say it the right way. And be like, oh, I'm going to follow this program. Man, you can't finish that program. <laughs> that, that program will put you in the, that'll put you in a nursing home. <laughs> you, can't, you can't finish that program without special vitamins. Yeah. You know, you cannot. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I love now, of, like, especially now when it's... Think, yeah. A lot of people think that more judo is the answer to be, becoming good at judo. It is not. It's not. Competitive judo is not about being good at judo. You don't have to be good at judo to win a judo match. What do you mean? You need to be good at the at this at understanding competition and understanding the rules, understanding how to win. Judo is a game based upon game theory. For me, as a judo coach, what is what is the most beautiful throw in judo? To me, it's Uchimata. Uchimata. What is the what is the throw that what is the throw that you get the most penalties from for head diving? Uchimata. Uchimata. So Uchimata comes with an art. Uchimata comes with some risk already. Learning Uchimata comes with a high risk. I can spend a lot of time doing Uchimata, and when the forces are coupled and I'm throwing with somebody else. And I'm trying to commit to the throw because you're told not to let go when you commit. You can end up getting hit with Hansukamake. What other throw has a higher rate of Hansukamake like Uchimata? Um, Harai Makikomi. It's not the same, but still, if you no, can. It's not, dive. Not, it's not even close. It's a similar throw, but it don't have the same head dive. Yeah. Why would I spend the amount of time teaching somebody Uchimata that I want to com- that I want to develop into a competitor? When you told if you told me you're 17 years old, from 17 to 23 for six years, do you think I'm going to spend my time on Uchimata? It's a poor investment. Yeah. Economically speaking, if we if we look at the economics of judo, economically speaking, for the money that we're going to spend, that's a bad investment. That comes with a high level of risk. What's a better throw? I mean, like uh, hip tosses, like you see, like how they went, especially right versus left, they just insert themselves. Iliadis was really good. He would just pick them up on his hips and just boom, no risk. No risk. Tao Toshi's a better throw. Yeah. Harai Goshi has a high, Harai has a high counter rate because you hook to the outside. They, Tani Otoshi. Kyle Toshi is a way better throw. If I don't hit it, I get a good slice movement. Then I Tao Toshi, Tomonagi. I do Uchimata and I miss. When you do Uchimata and you miss, what's the transition for Uchimata? There isn't one. There's no transition for Uchimata. There is Tomonagi, but you have to completely disengage. Mariyama is good at it, but not everyone can do that. If, if I miss Sanagi, if I miss Sanagi, I know how to shoot forward and move to my guard. I miss Sanagi, I can crawl backwards. I can just do a front, front flip, front roll. Kitadai mm-hmm. would do that. Impossible head dive penalty. Yeah. Tao Toshi, Osoto, great transition. 
so you, you'd have to be like economically speaking counter wise uh, also lifting wise uh, get strong and then build up the so it's it's a big cycle uh because yes. like, again i've never worked with professionals or talked to them about their training and there's just so much that i don't know so i had one uh, athlete i had one athlete when i was training him for the olympics in 2008 we eliminated we removed uchimata from his repertoire removed it he was a specialist in it yes he oh was good God. at it okay but did it pay off he beat the number one player in the world the first round then he lost the next round Ah, huh. okay so it did it did pay off it was taraji williams murray in 2008 he beat the number one player in the world at 60 kilos from Japan. Oh, you're talking about Beijing? Yes. Beijing Olympics was very interesting. Uh, I want to say, uh, what else? I want to say, uh, the, so, in terms of uh, group fighting, you also run workshops, you also specialize in group fighting, uh, you, I saw your stories on Instagram is about all that putting that mental, psychological, physical pressure. Um, it seems that it's one of the current of many currents of thoughts or in terms of group fight. For example, Russians, Georgians, like they want to put on that pressure as quick as possible. Like I fought Russians, I fought Georgians uh, here in the in Paris. Like they put that pressure and the strength really quickly. Like you, you like. The minute yes. they grab you, it's like you're paralyzed. Like, oh my god, like I cannot do anything, even though he's just gripping you. Uh, the Japanese, they just want to be comfortable. They they want to keep that distance. So whenever they decided to shoot in, they can go in. Um, it's it's a completely different game. Uh, the Japanese sometimes they they even let you think you're in control, and then just boom. Uh, and sometimes they just really like flick the lapel, keep on moving, keep on moving, and then when you're just completely decimated mentally, physically. That's when they go in. For example, Van der Geest, you know, at the 2001 championship. Uh, Van der Geest was like, at the end was like this, and that Uchimata came. It's, it's still one of the best, in my opinion, that you produce. So when it comes to your grip fighting system, is it, um, like, I've never seen it, or I'm not, I haven't been to a workshop. I don't live in the U.S., obviously, but is it similar to Georgian, Russian, or where you just want to pile on that strength and that pressure right off the bat or there's a there's a little game that you want to play no there's there's definitely a game and an understanding of how to kill the the sleeve and to kill the shoulder a lot of my stuff i learned from eddie liddy uh, a lot of what i learned from jimmy pedro then i put my own you know salt and pepper inside of the dish um people can go to gripfighting.com um i have a free seminar that you can watch it's like I think about a like a four or five hour seminar that's 100% free. Uh, it's the Grip Fighting Academy that you go into. Um, my system is just very very different, and what's very what's hard about grip fighting is when you're learning it in the beginning, you're gonna lose because you have to develop an ordered way to of, of putting your hands. And what you're going to want to do is what most people do. You're going to want to, I put my hands here to do this throw. And I put my hands here to do this throw. And I put my hands here to do this throw. You can't do that at the international level. Because once you try to put your hands somewhere to do a certain technique and they see it a couple of times, it's going to shut it down. You need to be able to grip fight for two reasons. You grip fight one so that you can throw. And you grip fight two so that you can't be thrown. Grip fighting has nothing to do with throwing. Grip fighting is about controlling. You have to control the fight and control the match. Yeah. So it, it has nothing to do with being to throw, but it's about pre preventing the throw. Sorry, it, it cut off the, the connection. It's about control. Mm. And being in control means I can choose to throw if I want to, or I can choose not to be thrown. The choice is mine, not yours. Mm. We go back to the negotiation table. Correct. Correct. Now, 
Are there some offshoots? Yeah, there's the there's the Wani Lee Tire Toshi, where Wani Lee's sleeve is controlled, but he finds a way to still throw. Wani Lee is he's not normal. Okay. Yeah. yeah, what he did was phenomenal. There's some people who have found ways to throw when being controlled. Um, those are the offshoots. Yeah. You can't you can't teach the the, the offshoots and the one-offs. You have to teach basic standard grip fighting, and people need to learn the rules and learn how to grip. That's one big mistake, uh, a big mistake that beginners do. For example, they see themselves being absolutely destroyed, and then they say, you know what, I'm going to learn to throw from a bad position. That should come after you got your throws in, after you got your system in, after you got everything in. Then, you know, something happens then, okay, I can be comfortable in a bad position, then I'm going to throw. But don't make this your entire system. We teach people throws. We teach them throws. You got to throw. You got to learn Osoto. You got to learn Ogoshi. You got to learn Koshiku. And we teach them all these throws, but we don't teach them you cannot throw until you get the inside position. You cannot do this throw until you get this. You, You understand what I'm saying? We don't teach that. We don't teach it. You know, you have to get to the point where we're doing Osoto that before I do the Osoto, I pop the hand off the off the off the lapel, boom, then I come in and do the Osoto. I just don't come in and just keep throwing everybody Osoto. You they have to get to the point where they understand the pop Osoto. Pop Kouchi. They they have to they you have to start putting the grip fighting in. Like even to the point where when my when my kids get ready to do a throw. I don't have that. They don't grab the lapel first and then grab the sleeve. They grab the sleeve, lock it down, and they put their hand on the lapel. And then they start the Uchikome. Because it's sleeve first. It's very French. Like the Japanese, they want to, they want, they do the lapel field and then, then they start to look for, for the sleeve. No, they don't, man. No? You're talking about lefty versus righty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 different on the on the the kenkayotsu is different from the ayots. Kenkayotsu. Yeah, like the sleeve is way too far to catch it first. You get the front side sleeve. That's why they kill the front side sleeve, and then when you move it, then they put their hand up. I, I so need to. I'm a, I'm a lefty. You're a righty, correct? No, I'm left. You're lefty. So a righty, as a righty, a righty will come out and, and grab, just grab your, your wrist or your left hand. Yeah. And then you pull it back and then he grabs the lapel. And right. now if you try to bring your, your, your left hand in, he drops his right what? Elbow. And moves. Now you can't get it in. And when you go to come back out, that's when you get hit with the opposite side what? So now you. Okay. But th- you know what, th- what I find really interesting is that if, like you study grip fighting a lot, even even though you also were very good at shooting, like disengaging from all the gripping, no. and it just, <laughs> I find that uh, the, like, the you have like both best of both worlds. Yeah, but and that's that's because it falls under the so there's no handed judo, there's one handed judo, there's grip and go judo, and then there's two handed judo. So the best grip and go judo person was Ungvari. Ungvari is the best grip and go person I've seen. It's grip and go judo. <laughs> Never settling in two hands. The best two-handed judo player that we've seen is who? In a way. The best one-handed judo player we've seen is who? Koga. Ah, oh, with the sail. It's one-handed. He's so there. Yes, and he's one-handed. And if you notice, it's the same type of judo that Travis Stevens plays. Travis Stevens plays a one-handed judo game. Yeah, Koshiguru Masayonage, yeah. It's one-handed judo. So you have no-handed judo, one-handed judo, grip-and-go judo, and two-handed judo. I had a great no-handed judo game. But the no-handed judo game comes off of being ahead and what's called a movement tempo. So I grab your sleeve, and because I grab your sleeve, that moment when you pull your sleeve away is the moment that I enter. And then if I've beaten you on grip fighting, or I, what I do is I, I, I attack one, boom, attack twice. 
I know I, I've attacked twice. So under the, when I was playing, even now, it's like two or three or four, two, two to four unanswered attacks is a Shido, yes? So I attack once, boom, two, boom, three, boom. Now I'm not attacking anymore. Now I'm creeping into the space. I know now you have to come to what? To okay. me. As soon as you come to me to attack, what I do? Wow. Double. Because I've created, I've created the Kazushi, but the Kazushi is not created from the gripping. The Kazushi has not been created from the psychology. Uh, so like the, the, the lunging in comes from like all the other attacks that came in first. Correct. That's, that, that's such a broad way of seeing it. It's not just, okay, I'm gripping his... Because me, I, I don't think of competition like, I, okay, I do a lot of randori and uh, competition. I've like ever since COVID, I couldn't compete now uh, with the being a brown belt and uh, preparing. Like there's, there's just so much that are just like, even with the, all the COVID cases, they, they've limited a lot of competing in my club. So I haven't competed in a while and uh, hopefully it's just going to change when I go somewhere else. So I don't think in terms of Shido and I think in terms of putting my hands on and just getting that throw, like that Ippon mentality, so to speak. Uh, I know now like with the game and everything, it's much broader, but uh, like everyone has something to like to offer. Like you've, 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 um, I, I, listen, I want to tell you this. I have a, I have a blueprint of a, of, of a, of judo, how I teach judo. When you walk out to the judo match, what's the first thing that you do? Like when I first start engaging? Yes. I want to look for my grips. So grip fighting is the first thing that you, you do. It's the last thing that you learn. You have not yet. You have not learned how to grip fight yet. You, I mean, know, seen... you, you, you know certain gripping tactics. Yeah. Get your hand, but you don't know how to grip fight yet. Yeah. Now, watch this. After you grip, what's the next thing you do? I look for the opening. Yeah, you, do, you look for the throw, right? Yeah. So, does every throw, do more throws result in scores or no scores? Uh, uh, do, you mean when I go for them or when I try to go for them? When you when you throw, let's just say when you throw, do most other throws end in the poem? I'd say about thirty to forty percent. So you're telling me that you're throwing for your poem thirty percent of the time? Oh yeah, it's not possible. Not unless your partners suck. <laughs> if you <laughs> listen, if when you if you look at so let's look let's look at the Olympics. Wait, wait, I'm not talking about Tokiwaza. Tokiwaza or like the, the technique. No, not, not really just to, 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 in a In a four minute match, yeah. every throw that you throw is not any poem. No, of course not. No. So watch. So every throw that you make ends either in a poem or no e poem. So most of the throws end in no e poem. And if they're no e poem, they either end in Wazari or what? Nothing. Oh. If it ends in Wazari or nothing, both of those options provide an opportunity to do what? A uh, combo or like a transition? Newaza. Yeah. So every throw, okay, has the option to be either any pawn or not any pawn. Most throws are not a pawn, which means Every throw that you practice should have an element of transition in Newaza. Right. So the throw doesn't matter. Every throw should be a system. Every throw should have a all the way to the finish. Because more often than not, it's going to result in no throw and no score. And you have to learn throws, sweeps, and takedowns. Because there's some movements that we do that are just takedowns that are not meant to score. They're just meant to get the person to the what? To the ground. To the ground, but look like they are supposed to score so we don't get the penalty. 
but they're just takedowns. Which means the two most important elements in the game, based upon what you're going to see, based upon the e economics of the judo game, are one, the grip fighting, and two, the newaza. Because for you to throw for a pawn, you got to be really, really good, or it takes a it takes a long time. But I can stop you from throwing me easier than I can throw you. And if I stop you from throwing me, every poor attack that you do provides me an opportunity for Nawaza, and every good attack that I do provides me an opportunity for Nawaza. Which means the most important elements are the grip fighting and the what? Nawaza. And in order to be able to grip fight, grip fighting requires movement of the hands. When you, when you start moving the hands and the arms a lot, the heart rate goes up. Which means, in order for me to be a good grip fighter and good in Nawaza, I need to be in really good what? Shape. You ever notice you can do all those throws and still get in a judo match and get tired? When you're in a judo match, how many throws actually happen? What's the maximum amount of throws that happen in a four-minute judo match? Me? Anybody. Myself, I can speak. I've gotten, I'd say, three, four throws in a four-round. The maximum, the maximum you can do, okay? Four-minute match, right? 20-second blocks. Two, four... It's, it's one, two, three, three, one, two, three, six, one, two, three, nine, one, two, three, twelve. The maximum amount of throws are twelve. Whoa. In a judo match, you're not getting tired from the throwing. The maximum amount of throws you're going to see in a judo match are twelve. So why in the hell are we spending all that time doing all those throws? It's because when you do throw, you need to be a what? A sharpshooter. But you can spend your time doing those throws, or you can spend your time becoming really, really good in Nawaza. But also now, uh, a lot of people they, they 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 try to like, okay, I'm gonna like go for a throw, but I, I really actually want to do Nawaza. For example, Charlene van Snick from Belgium. Uh, she was in Budapest. Like she has a bronze from London. She placed, I believe, seventh in Tokyo. And yet she was eliminated from the first round in Budapest because she was, you know, the, the referee told her, hey, stop going to the ground. Eventually it was three shidos and she was out. You have some biased refereeing. Yeah. She's not going to change her style because of that, or that, because of that one ref. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And let me tell you something. Judo cannot reduce the amount of newaza because the marketplace has changed. People want to see groundwork now. If you notice, it's a lot more groundwork now at these tournaments because it's because of the MMA and the UFC and all these other organizations. People, you have a more informed practitioner. People want to see the mat work. The problem is, is that the IGF reduced the matches down to four minutes because they want more excitement. But the thing about it is, is that if I'm really working on the ground, I can eat up a good 90 seconds of the match on the ground. So if I'm a really good gripper and I get good Nawaza, I'm taking up the time that you could possibly do what to me? Bro, um, you know, spectator friendly judo. It's all spectator friendly. The groundwork is spectator friendly too. The, the the people that don't know Nawaza, they, they they will not understand what's happening, unfortunately. Yeah, but, but people people who don't know Nawaza aren't watching. Yeah, but uh, I, this is so confusing. Like, who is watching? Who is the spectators? Then you know, we just let stop. Let me tell you something. Mate let me, tell you, and then let me say this. Up. And I listen. I know Neil Adams. I'm a great. I'm a great fan of Neil Adams. All right. Neil and I, we don't often disagree. Here's what I want to say, all right? And I, I have nothing negative to say about Neil. He is a wonderful, outstanding person, and he does great stuff for judo. We all have our biases, okay? When you speak to Neil, okay, Neil has a bias because Neil 
is paid by the IGF. Yeah. Neil, and he is not. Neil is not going to say anything negative about the IGF. I've never said. If he's critical about about them, he usually does it behind the scenes, as he should, because it is the right thing to do. Neil is not a jackass. He's not an asshole. He is a really good dude. And when you ask him questions, his job is to defend the position of the IJF. And he might be telling you the truth, but he's still defending the position of the IJF. There's, 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 there's no universe where you're going to tell me that the judo that's being played now looks better than the judo in the 90s and the 2000s. It's not possible. I can, I can show you a highlight reel from back then and show you a highlight reel from now. Man, people love the slams. I watched the, the old world championships. They, they, say the, they say the judo looks bad. The judo looks bad now. The judo looks like a bunch of penalties. And, and let me tell you something. The cheating was so bad at the last Olympics. When Teddy Renner was fighting, they did not give that Japanese guy a penalty. They would not give him a penalty. It's almost like they tried to cheat Teddy Renner. You watched this match, yes? Yeah. They would not give a penalty. Listen to me. They, the, the Are you talking about that, the team championship, the finals? I, believe, I, I don't know if it was the team championship or, or if it was the finals. I think it was the finals. Yeah, the, the, the Japanese was just simply not engaging. He wasn't. He didn't attack. He did not attack once in the whole in the whole regulation. Did he get? He should have been shitoed out of there, right? Yeah. He didn't. But he did not get shitoed. It was almost like they were. It felt like they were trying to set Teddy up. I'm. I'm. I'm telling you this, man. The way that the game is now, it's not more exciting. And I don't agree with this. Not putting more referees on the map. I need to be able to see who's making what calls. It, is, it provides a higher level of, um, of transparency. All this whispering in somebody's ear bullshit, and then somebody makes a call. Bro, do you understand behind the scenes that the people who are getting on that, on that um, walkie-talkie and talking in that person's ear, telling that person to call a Cheeto? There are times when people are telling the person on the map to call a Shido. I have been there. So what's what's happening? Okay, if it's not more exciting, then what, what, what are we trying to do? I don't know what we're trying to do. I have no clue. I have no clue because right now, here's what you have. Right now, you have a crop of black belts, and you will be one of them, okay? You have a crop of, a crop of black belts who don't know Tegaruma, don't know Morote Gari, don't know... Um, Kibu, Not that good, real Kibu you don't need a, you, you don't know the the ankle picks, the far side knee taps. You don't you don't know any of these things. You don't know the like you don't know a lot of these moves. You don't know them. Just like I'm a black belt who didn't grow up learning kind of basami. I didn't grow up learning Waki Gitami from standing. So my black belt is weaker than the black belt from the generation before. A hundred years ago, they're going to say, uh, we did the uh, Ashigarami and ankle locks. Correct. But we're not... Neck I, I, don't, I don't know why... I don't know why people think that the judo looks better. The judo does not look better. It just looks different. Yeah. And let me tell you something. In my youth, okay, if I line up against Teddy Renner, all right, one out of ten times, I'm going to double leg Teddy Renner and put him down. That's a fact. There's no, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's, there's not, it's, it's, Teddy Renner is 6'8", my man. He's all legs. His advantage should also be his disadvantage. If Teddy Renner is 6'8 and you can't touch his legs, what? Yeah. There's, a, that, there's a clear bias for people who are what? Taller. Come on, man. Uh, one thing I do like about today's system is Wazari Ippon. Koka and Yuko 
I don't know. I think it leaves rooms for stalling. I don't know, man. I like it. If I throw you and you land on your butt, I like it. Today, I think that's a wizard, you know? No, you, I think they got to roll back. Unless they just changed it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not the same. If I throw you and you land on your butt, it's not the same as I throw you tile toes and you over-rotate and land on your side. It's not the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, but I know. I really appreciate The problem is, is that's hard for the spectators. Spectators don't understand Coco Yuko was all right. They do not. But I, I appreciated the, the Yuko and the Wazari. The Yuko and the Coca. I appreciate it because all throws are not the same, man. Like a lot of people, they would just land a Coca, which like a really terrible Coca, and then just, would just hold on to it like for the rest of the fight. By today's standards, it would never score. Like even landing front side also. Coca, I'd say we can remove it. Yuko, it, yeah, I mean, okay, it, there's probably a place for it, but Coca, I don't see it. So listen, under the under the new rules, okay? Yeah. I never would have lost that. Under the new scoring rules, I don't lose that match to Jane. Yeah. That, that's not a score. Yeah, I was like looking like, well, why is it scored? I was like, ah, okay. Back uh, then, the old rules. Okay. Yeah. So... But they never gave Jeng a penalty. He, yeah, he barely attacked compared to all oh those God. strikes. Listen, that's, but, and I tell people, he earned that right. Jeng came into that. He, he was the silver medalist in the world. Yeah. And then he got silver at the Olympics. If you're going to beat Jeng, you got to beat him outright. That's, those are the facts. And I threw everything in the kitchen sink at him, but it wasn't enough. Single double. It, I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh my god, what is happening here? And then I'm like, okay, he's defending. Like that's what judo should be. Like that's spectator friendly. Come on. That was spectator. That was. Let me tell you something. That was an exciting judo match. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what that's what it should look like, in my opinion. The problem is, is that at the 60 kilo and 66 kilo level, some of the the Georgians and the Mongol, they were just sitting there bent over, acting like they're trying to touch the leg. Too many firemen's carries. That's what it was really happening. Too many. Too, it's not, it wasn't the double leg. It's the firemen's carries that they were all misses. Yeah. Um, also, one thing, like, even, like, quote, terrible judo or defensive judo, even back then, I saw penalties for like gripping the pants and pushing away or put, posting your forearm and not letting them get close. There were shidos for these things. So to say, you know, leg grabs was rewarding bad judo, I don't see it as an argument. Like maybe, for example, you want to put a shido on those that disengage, 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 disengage. They don't want to engage like Nadan and then the German against Suzuki. And then, oh, I'm going to go for the leg from a very bad position and just land you on your butt and then just hold on to that score. Maybe like you penalize the disengaging and the bent over so you don't engage. Suzuki I went like in the Beijing Olympics. You saw the you saw the two matches of Suzuki. He was out really early and the the same tactics like Naidan did not engage, did not engage, and then just shot on the legs. Uh, mm -hmm. The German did the same thing. He took him to the edge of the mat, just like grabbed the pants and just did this. Ah, I, I misspoke earlier. So that was Suzuki won in two thousand four against Tamanov, right? Yeah, and in yes, 2008, yeah. in uh, against the Mongolian, he was hit with a Morotegari. He landed on his and butt, and it was given the, a Nippon. The Mongolians really studied my Morotegari in 2004. They told me that at the um, Cadet World Championships. Oh? Yes. It was something, man. They, they didn't, The English wasn't good, but they recognized me when I was coaching for the Bahamas and came over and talked to me and were talking about my Morotegari. It was yeah. something. I was amazed. Yeah. I was amazed. Yeah, it, was, it was nice. It's pretty nice. But let me let me say this, man. I think that a time is going to come where judo is going to go back to where it was before. It should. You say it shouldn't? It should. I think it should. I think the matches, I think the matches for men should be five minutes, and I think the matches for women should be four minutes. Why? Be it's it's a there's a power difference. There's more lean muscle. That men that men have that that they're carrying, they can they can they can they can exert power over a over that five minute period. They can. Gender, gender aside, 
like how many fights are going to go to score like way too many so you can mm -hmm. afford to make it longer no the, the matches are they're longer than they were before because they're only four minutes here's the thing so i fought in trey tory in 2003 it's the first time i medal in europe it was so hot during the day that they made the preliminary matches four minutes. And they said that only the finals are going to be five minutes because it's the, the sun is going to go down. Yeah. You know what I told myself? What? I said, there's nobody in the world who can beat me in four minutes. Nobody. Under the old rules, in four minutes, Jeng is beat. I lose the Jeng 37 seconds left. In four minutes, there's nobody in the world gonna beat me in four. In four minutes, you don't have you don't have that much power. Like in four minutes. No, no. Man, I was in the finals. I made it to the finals, I lost in the finals. <laughs> because I lost, it was five minutes. Five minutes. I lost by the yeah, I lost by decision. Lost oh, by decision. oh yeah. So, do, so, do you so think golden was... wait, wait, do you think golden score should be out and bring back you say gachi? I I believe so, and the reason why is because the practices are dishonest either way. Explain. We're going to Golden Score, and Shitos aren't given. We're in Golden Score, and they're not giving the Shitos. And then they're choosing who they want to give the Shito to. And then you get to Golden Score. And some people are losing golden score just based upon, not based upon judo, but based upon just sheer fatigue. I'm 12 minutes in, I'm 13 minutes in, and I just, I just, I just get tired. And they had another golden score match earlier. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's given us a true, I don't think it's given us a true, a true winner. I think that going back to the flags, Let's everybody have a, a designated amount of time yeah. to produce a certain outcome because two people can meet in the third match and one guy has fought for 35 minutes and the other guy fought for 15. It's not the same. Yeah. It, it should, you should be rewarded if you throw for your pawn. And if you don't, you shouldn't be penalized by having to fight 12 minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes. Okay. That's a good argument for you say gachi. You say gachi. Also, but uh, like uh, the, the Mariama Abe fight to decide who was going to go to the Olympics. Oh my God, there were so many Shidos in there. It was clear that they wanted that guy to go to the Olympics. Correct. You can see it. Grab the wrist, grab the skirt, grab the leg, grab the. It's just, it's insane. And there, and I, I saw a lot of people in my comment section. It just really irritated me that I'm a referee and they didn't want such an important match to be won by Shido. Then, so, okay, so what are you doing? So you just. So what are you doing? So, 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 so now you're you cheating. Doing? Yeah, so, so now, now you're you, so now you, now you, not Shido. Now you decide what rules you're going to follow and what rules not to follow because it's a quote exciting match. Like, get out of exactly. here. It's exactly. It's not fair. Like they cheated a really good competitor out of a very like world no, champ no, opportunity. No, no, no. Okay, the other guy is good. He proved it, but you can't do that. You can't do that. I I I like what Brazil used to do. Brazil used to do two out of three, two out of three times. Yeah. Oh my God, the guys used to fight. I I felt so bad for those guys. They fought so many times against each other. So you fight two out of three, two out of three times. So you and I would fight two out of three. You win the two, I lose one. Then we fight again, two out of three. And this, I win this one. Now we got to fight another time. So two nine fights. Yes, but at least you know who the best person is out of the two. Like the Deguchi Klimkate was also not fair at all. She beat her every time they met. And let me tell you something. That's, at least Japan does that because before Japan would just select I remember that one guy from 60 kilos fought all those years, and then they brought my man back. What was the dude's name, 60 kilos from Japan? Nomura. 
Namura. They brought Namura back. And, and Namura came back and won gold medal. Yeah. In 2000. Was it 2000 or 2004 Namura came back? 2004 was his last one. Yes, he came back. He, listen, he retired, came back, and won in 2004. It's unbelievable. Yeah, three medals. Yes. I, I don't think... In terms of oh, in terms of old, I would say the greatest judo Olympian has to be Nomura. Yeah, unless you unless you think somebody else. Uh, no, I'd say it's uh, what's her name, Rio Kotani. The, she would also shoot on the legs. The Japanese one in forty-eight, five Olympic medals. You're talking about Tamura, yeah, Tamura. I, I know I asked Tamura because I'm older than you. Tamura, yes. Rokatani, how many, how many Olympic medals she have, does she have? Five. How many gold? Two. Yeah, you have to, you have to give it to her because for, for, of the life, lifetime, how, how many times she's been. Five, five Yeah, like 16 years on the, on the podium. Yes, 20 years. 20 years. 20 years on the podium. Yeah, that's, that's yes, on the podium. Yes. On the woman's side, you have to give it to her. On the men's side, you got to give it to Namura. Yeah, For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Also, you have to give it to Montero as an honorable mention for competing to 2004 till Tokyo and then finally getting a spot on the podium in Rio on the, for the bronze. Thelma Montero. Te I know Thelma from, um, from Portugal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's a like model. That's, too. Yeah. She yes. says, I'm not hungry, I'm insatiable. It shows. Um, did she get on the podium before? In... No, no, no. She never got on the podium. She only got on the podium in Rio. Okay. But she was good, man. Yeah. She got on the podium. Good she was good. Yeah. Let me tell you something. But I can't put her over Kayla Harrison. No way. No way. No way. No. <laughs> No way. I don't think I don't think someone realize, as dominant, someone oh. I don't think people realize like that these people are comparing these people compare these MMA people to 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 Kayla Harrison. There's no comparison, man. Yeah. There's no comparison. have done Tokyo too, I think. Oh my gosh. Kayla Harrison is a different animal, man. Yeah. She she's a different level of human being. You know something what really I really like? I it's something that I like to do sometimes when I when I feel bad about my judo or when I feel bad about my you know about my life or when I'm trying to achieve something and I can't. I look back, I go see, for example, in a way Kose getting thrown by Uchimata against Kovacs. In a way, getting thrown by Uchimata. I see Harrison, like the Sankaku goddess. Going to sleep by a Sankaku. So it's just to see that these are not these like invincible giants, but like they also struggled and lost. So it's like it's a really good reminder that you know you're gonna lose, but it's it's per like not permanent, uh, temporary as long as you keep going. So it's nice to go and see these types of fights because you see where they come from and what they uh, did end up achieving. I, re I remember I, I was in Hungary in 1998 and I watched Kovacs beat in a way. In that 1998. I don't know what he beat him with then. I don't, I don't think it was the double sleeve Uchimata then. Um, yeah, I think I, it was 99 when he did that. 99 he did that. But, but listen, he had beat him in 98. I was, I was there. I, I forget what he beat him with in 98. Um, no, 98, because Kovacs would grab lapel. And grab the pants and just run because Kovacs was six eight. Yeah, Kovacs was six feet eight. Like Kovacs was so tall, man, it was unbelievable. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's not that tall. I think he's like five eleven or six feet. Five eleven, yeah, five eleven. Yeah, but he used to try to. That's my height. So I was there in '99 at Tokai when he was working on the technique for against Kovacs. So they start working Morote Selnagi and Iri Morote Selnagi. For Kovacs. Yeah, he's tall. tall. So that, that's how you get him. And that's what he started doing. And that's when, that's when, that's when anyway started working on that drop, Sanagi. The way he got Trenu in it in Paris was just absolutely amazing. 
But he got Kovacs with Oh Chigari, which is really surprising. Um, Trey New was a really, really good judo player, man. That dude was tough. And Trey New was really smart, man. Like a really smart judoka. Really, really smart judoka. I remember um, training with him, too, man. Training with him and Pavel Nastula. Just beatings, man. Just beatings. Just, it was just beatings. Beatings. I, I, I took be, I took beating. I took a beating at the, the, the Paris camp. I took a beating, man. It was a, it was a beating. It wasn't bad as training. Training in Paris was bad. Training in Japan was the worst training experience of my life. Man, I cried. I cried every morning, Shadi. I cried every morning, man. My um, I was at Tokai, and it was. And I was there for Kangeku training, which is the winter training. And they open up all the windows and doors, 5.30 in the morning is the training. And you wake up and you ride your bike downhill and it's uphill all the way back. And after training the judo, you know, all your, the skin on your fingers is gone and all, your, and then all your, and you know, and every time you bend your hand, everything hurts. Hurts. And, and then you have shaking. to take a, yes, you have to take a shower. And when you take a shower, the water hits your hands and it burns. And then you're trying to wash your body and wash your hands. And then you put your hands underneath the water to wash your face. And everything burns, man. And then you brush your teeth. And the toothpaste from your mouth drips from the toothbrush onto your knuckles, man. And it bur- everything burns. And then, you know, you can not you can barely bend your fingers because you, your training so bad. My fingers are messed up now to this day. But then when you get to the dojo... You have to tape over you. You got to tape over the open skin, man. Yeah. There's no gauze or no, there's no shit like that, man. It's, you tape over the open skin so that it doesn't get worse. And then when you get done training, you got to take that fucking tape off, man. Oh, my God. Man, to think about it now to this day. You know what I do? I put the Band-Aid and then I tape over it. That's I didn't have, I was already there. I didn't have any, I didn't have anything. I couldn't go to the store. Man, it was, it was miserable. I remember I got there one day, and we warm up, and they just hit the um, they hit the gong, boom. And the guy came and bowed in front of me. It was, and I look at the clock, and it said fifty nine, fifty nine, fifty nine, fifty eight, fifty nine, five seven. I said, what the fuck is going on here? It's a one hour round. With the same person? I didn't make it. I didn't make it. I made it 37 minutes. Oh. I can, and it was an 81 kilo guy. He was wearing my ass out because he was too fast. Oh my gosh. I can still, I can still tell you what he did to me this day. Because it's, it's why I left. I, I literally walked off the mat and went downstairs. I'm standing lefty. He's standing righty. He came in and faked like he was doing a you know, overhand Marote this way, faked. I blocked. He then stepped across my leg, boom, and caught me in a in a, a kubinagi, like a koshigaruma. Kubinagi. Oh, okay. Boom. I, I didn't have my hands. Boom. Landed right on my head and onto my back. When I laid on the ground for a moment, I got up, and I walked off the mat. <laughs> oh, my God. It, it's a good thing you didn't injure your neck. My man. I had, I was at the point where I had it, like emotionally, I had had it. It was, I was at my, I was at my. Yeah. And for people who, for people who train hard, you get like this emotionally. You just, you get to the point where you, you can't take anymore. I could not take anymore. Yeah. And I, I just left. I left. I came back the next day, but that day I was done, man. I was done, man. Done. Couldn't take anymore. Yeah, it was something. And then, and then we got weight training in the evening. Train weights with the team. It was something, man. It was, it was an, it was an experience. You're talking about Tokai? Tokai, yes. Yeah, Tokai are the toughest guys. You have also Tenri uh, down. Tenri, yeah. But for me, I went to Tokai because I was there for the heavyweights. So I'm there with, um, I was there with, with Kosei Inoue. Then I was there with his brother. 
Um, Tomokazu, anyway. He, Kosei's brother could beat him. Yeah. But he couldn't beat everybody else. It was like some big brother syndrome. Yeah. And then there was, um, they had some, I think the, the, like a high school national champ, there was 100 kilos. And then the rest of the guys were in the room. So usually when you go to, when you're at home, you don't have a, you don't have a lot of heavyweights your size. But when you're in there with the world champ, they have people in there his size. So every round, you could do eight, 10 rounds at home and, and no problem because some rounds are 90 kilos, 80 kilos, 73, 100, 100 plus. But in Japan, every round is 90, 100, 100 plus. Oh my God, it's, it wears you down. It wears you out. Of course. There was something. It was something. It was something. I can't imagine. All right. How much time do you have left? We we're, yeah, clo- we're closing we in. Minutes, right, eight minutes. Eight minutes. All right. All right. Okay, great. Um, have you have you ever thought of, uh, like you see now, like there's, there's just all these instructionals. Have you ever thought of, you know, doing a, a system course and selling it? I'm sure it will clean out. Like this, maybe over, group fighting or maybe. I have, I have, a, I have over 14,000 students on Udemy.com. I have something called the Grip Fighting Academy, where I have my whole grip fighting system. It's on gripfighting.com. Yeah. I have my Newaza system that's available. It's on newazaexcellence.com. I got clock choke, the Okuri Irijime. I got um, my armbar boot camp. I have um, uh, Senkaku. All my stuff is my stuff is already online. I'm I'm starting my pressure system too. Which is more of a coaching program, and I do I do year long coaching programs too. Like if anybody wants to understand grip fighting at a high level, www.gripfighting.com. I am unequivocally the best grip fighting instructor in the world. Period. I give a shit about how many medals you got, or where you got them from, or how you got them. Your ability to fight is different than my ability to teach. I got a PhD in education and I know how to dole out the information to put it in bite sized chunks to disseminate it and inculcate it in such a fashion with, yeah. with the type of presentation that I was going to allow people to learn. Right. OK, now let's let me ask you this, because personally, I do believe there's a big yes in this. Do you think there's doping in judo? Do I think there's doping in judo? Yeah. Do I think there's doping in judo? Yeah. Like, we, we, like ADCC, all these, like, there's no need to even talk about it, but I'm talking in judo. Judo is the cleanest sport ever. <laughs> There's my answer. Okay. <laughs> you like, that was good, right? That was good? Yeah, that was good. That was good. <laughs> I will leave it up for the, for the people to, to, shoot, to choose from. <laughs> and and the, the reason why I say that is because um, I think that the people who who have excelled in our sport deserve recognition, and and they deserve the benefit of the doubt, right. And I don't want people thinking that everybody who has an Olympic gold medal or is on a podium is doping. That's not true. No, no, I'm not, I'm not no, saying but that. But listen, that, that's what the, the, general, the general viewer makes those type of, of psychological leaps and connections. Yeah. And the, the honest to goodness truth is that in our sport, it's very similar to chess. Like you can take steroids as much as you want to. It's not going to help you become a better chess player. No. I mean, you can, you can be Ronnie Coleman and you get on a mat with a heavyweight, Ronnie Coleman is going to lose. Yeah. Period. There's a technical element of our sport that supersedes any type of drug that you're going to take. Um, do some people dope? I'm sure some people dope like in other sports. Do I think that doping is a huge issue in judo? 
No. No. Now, I, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that doping doesn't happen in judo. Do I think it's a huge issue? No, because no. the issue, the fact of the matter is, you have to you have to be able to grip your ass off. You need to have some some good tachiwaza, and you need to have some good ass newaza. And you can sit in a room and pump your ass with a bunch of needles and go lift weights, and that ain't gonna help you. It can help if you're recovering from an injury, like if it heals faster. But yes. if like technique-wise, judo-wise, no. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. The other questions. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I I came in. I I, I always like I love when I go into a conversation. Like I want to learn this, 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 and then I come back. I come out with like like a huge. Like, uh, I, I did not expect such a broad and big perspective on so many things, like the judo elements, the, the structure, the going into the waste room, how you structure things. Uh, it's, it, again, I, I'm very happy I, I got to have this talk, and um, thank you so much for taking the time. Man, I, I appreciate it. I'll tell you what, man. The, um, when I was the head coach of the Bahamas Judo Federation, I asked the head coach, I said, what's the goal here? He said, man, I want to stop losing. I said, we can do that. Yeah. And we ended up producing the first youth Olympian ever in the Bahamas, a woman by the name of Cynthia Ramming. She won the first international match. She won a match at the Youth Olympics. That had never happened before in the Bahamas. They had never gone to youth youth Olympics, and they never won an international match. Yeah. Outside of you know they winning at the U.S. Open, but I'm talking about a, a a an international match crossing the Atlantic Ocean. They never won. Absolutely fantastic. Man, and she, and she did well. She did well. She did well. So I think she attended a, a couple of world championships after that. She did well. Yeah. Reminds me of that movie, the the Jamaican bobsled team. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, like you can see, like they have zero budget. They have, but look where these people came from, and look at the dream that they had, and they eventually like made it. Like they went and competed. It's a really, I, I love that movie. Like it's it's one and of I, my childhood's I, favorite movies. One of my, that is one of my greatest accomplishment accomplishments in the sport was serving as the head coach with Bahamas Judo Federation because. We got to teach judo inside the schools. Um, I got to work with the the president of the federation and build the sport, um, have the sport become more of a nationally recognized sport. Um, we had an opportunity to, and I don't know, Cynthia is still young and, you know, relatively to me. And in her mind, I know she wanted to do things on the world level. I know she wanted to go to the, you know, to the, what we call the regular Olympics. But I don't think that she knows how big it was for her to go to the Youth Olympics, you know, at that time when she went. She went in 2010, and it was absolutely, it was, it's, a, it's a massive experience. She competed at the Youth Olympic Games. And um, as someone, my, my family is from the Bahamas. My grandparents on both sides are from the Bahamas. It was, a, it was a great experience to go back to the Bahamas and to coach and to be able to accomplish something like that with a player from the Bahamas. It was absolutely fantastic. One of the best, one of my greatest accomplishments and it's not really mine, but one of, I would say one of my greatest contributions because it's her accomplishment and my contribution to the, um, to the art and the sport was that. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, it's uh, to take something that's almost impossible and to just give it hope that's better than like all those like decorated champions many times. Like 
some people really want that little moment or that something that little push and i'm sure she's gonna remember you forever so yes she didn't like me though when i was training her but of course not <laughs> <laughs> she, she told me she's still psychologically scarred I, <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try to tell people, man, everybody loves sausage, but nobody wants to know how it's made. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. So All right. that's, for the people who are watching, please, www.gripfighting.com and www.newazaexcellence.com. And if you don't have any training partners and you find yourself in, in places where uh, the pandemic is still is still ongoing and you need to be able to learn how to train by yourself or with a training dummy, you can go to my training program. It's a 52 week training program that you can use with a dummy. Or if you have a training partner, you can find it at www.mattworkmagic.com. I'll That's make it. sure to leave all the links in the description and okay. as a pinned comment for sure. Let me turn off the recording real quick. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Wait, wait one second. Uh...